It's on record? Okay, so... Excuse me. Excuse me. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Is everybody... We started the recording, and so Shabbat Shalom. Uh, so this week, usually for Sukkot, they talk about uh, Gog and Migog, but I'm not that familiar about that, so I don't want to teach something that I don't really know about. So I'm just going to cover uh, the last portion uh, that's going to be read tomorrow on the Simchat Torah. That's when they reverse the role back all the way to Genesis. Uh, but I'm just going to cover the four portions. It's really short. It's uh, Vizot Chabracha. This is the blessing. And it's from Deuteronomy 33 all the way to 34, 12. Uh, so before we do anything, we're going to do the blessing for the Torah. So Baruch Atah Adonai Hamara. Baruch Adonai Hamara Le'olam Bayed. Baruch Atah Adonai Elokeinu Melech Ha'olam. Meshav Ha'olam Mikor Anin. Bless Adonai who was blessed. Bless is Adonai who was blessed now and forever. Bless are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has chosen us from among the peoples and given us the Torah. Bless are you, Adonai, who gives the Torah. So like I said, we're at the end of the Torah portion. And we've covered a lot. From Genesis, we saw you know God create from disorder, creation. And then from creation, we had the fall of man when Adam and Eve sinned. And then from there, everything went downhill to the point where God was going to wipe out the earth and put a flood over all the earth. But then we had Noah. And then from Noah, again, man fell again uh, until we got to Abraham. And then from Abraham, we had chaos with Jacob's family, with the brothers and Joseph. But then uh, finally, they got everything together and Joseph was able to save them from the famine. And then we get to Exodus. In Exodus, we have the Israelites are put. Technically, they sold themselves into slavery because they gave away their land and their rights to the Pharaoh. So they end up in the, uh, as slaves. And then God judges Egypt and then frees them through Moses. Uh, and then Moses receives the Torah and he gives it to the Israelites. But then they worship the golden calf. And so everything has to start from scratch again. And then afterwards, God commands the building of the tabernacle, the Mishkan. And then we get to Leviticus, and Leviticus is going to be about holiness. You're going to have the five offerings of Korbanot, the laws for the priests and ritual impurity, the feasts of Hashem, the laws establishing order amongst Israel. That, that's basically the point of Leviticus, is to establish order among the nation. And then we get to Numbers, and then things go bad again. The census is done first, and they prepare to leave uh, Sinai, but on the way they have rebellion. You have Korah that tries to rebel. And then you have the bad report from the ten spies, and because of that, they have to wander the, the wilderness for 40 years. And then they do a second census with the second generation once the old generation dies, and they're about to enter the promised land. But before they go into the promised land, Deuteronomy is basically a, a, a renewal of the covenant with the new generation of the Israelites. So it's going to recount Israel's history and how they got here, and why they should show God loyalty. You know, reiterating the laws that they must keep and updating some terms for the Israelites when they dwell in the land. You know, the, when they dwell in the land, the tabernacle is not going to be moving around anymore. It's going to be at a fixed point. So now certain laws have to be changed in regards to that. It's also going to establish the blessings and the curses again, so that way they know for sure what are the terms. And then when it comes to, not technically today's portion, but what's going to be read tomorrow, Moses is about to die. And he's going to pass on his leadership to Joshua. And before he does that, he gives a blessing to each of the tribes. But if you guys were paying attention to all the things that I went through, you see there's this pattern from chaos to order. And I remember in one of my uh, Bibles that I had in youth class, it described it as like a roller coaster. You know, Israel would be doing good, and then they would sin, and they were doing good, and then sin, and then it would be like that. And that's how it would display it. Uh, by the way, this is a sign a graph for the people who love math. Uh, <laughs> But the thing is, is that studying with Rico, I, I learned that it's not really like this. It doesn't follow this pattern, but it's cyclical. Every time Israel sinned, God tries to bring them back to the original plan, to restoration. And it happens over and over and over again until finally at the very end, that's when everything becomes restored and there's no more cycles again. But God keeps trying to bring them back to the point where everything's restored. And we see that all the way from Genesis to Revelation. When we get to Revelation at the very end, Chapter 22, it says, 
Then the angel showed me the river from the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. And I just like to point out that there's two thrones for two separate people. So they're not the same guys, because you know, there's some people that believe that. Uh, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will need, not need the light, uh, the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for Hashem will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. And if you go to some of your Bibles to that point, it's going uh, you know how sometimes the Bibles, they have the headings for the paragraphs? It's going to say, Eden restored. So they understand that this is like the Garden of Eden being restored, or, uh, like the way it's supposed to be. So you're going from Genesis... To Revelation, it's going all the way back. It's a cycle. And the whole point of that, of, of the Bible, is to try to bring that, that uh, order back. And that's what the Torah is. The Torah is supposed to establish order among the nation of Israel. Uh, this is a graph from the Jehovah's Witness. It's a good graph, but it's not accurate, so there's some stuff that's off. But what I like about it is that they separated it by different degrees of holiness. So when you go outside the camp, that's chaos. And then when you give the Israelites the Torah, that's when they have order and they get to hear. And the more closer you get to the holy place, the more, uh, what is the word? Uh, not requirements. What's the word? I don't know if anybody knows. Let's just go with the requirements. Some more requirements that you have to make to be able to get in there. Only one person can get in there and he has very high qualifications that he has to meet. Standards, I guess, um, maybe. But what was it? Uh, restrictions, but so I think it's a mixture of restrictions and standards. Whatever that word is, it would be that. But, but yeah, that's the whole point of the Torah. It brings order and it establishes holiness, holiness among the people. If you're going to be among God, you have to be at this certain limit, you know. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't understand about the Torah. It's not just about establishing justice and having a law. It's about giving you order in your life, because before that. Or outside of Israel, and you see all the other nations. We talked about how the nations they would worship, how they would behave, and it's crazy. You know, they're sacrificing kids, burning them alive. They're doing, you know, pagan idolatry. There's uh, temple prostitutes. They're doing. They're marrying their moms. They're doing stuff with animals. There's a lot of chaos going on. And that's the whole point of the Torah is to say, look, this is how things are supposed to be. That's how I want things to be. Uh, and until things are fixed, this is the the. Uh, what is it? A guiding book for you to follow so that we can have that order until things are restored. But then the question is, you know, who is the Torah for? You know, if you talk to Jewish people, they're going to say, well, you know, Gentiles, they don't really have to keep the law. They can keep the Noahide laws, which I think is like eating clean. And I think keeping the Sabbath is one of them. But they don't have to worry about the feast and the blessings for Israel. That's not for them. So, like, what's the point of keeping the commandments if I'm not blessed? Why am I going to be following this God if he doesn't even help me. So that doesn't really look good. And then if you go to the Christian side, they think that the law is just for salvation. So they they think that's bad, you know, because then you're denying Yeshua. So the Torah and Yeshua don't go together. But both those things are from uh, stem from a misunderstanding of the Bible. But if we go through the scriptures like we did this whole year, we see that that's not really true. Uh, for example, in this portion, it's going to say in Deuteronomy 33, 3 to 4, it says, surely it is you who love the people. You is talking about God. All the holy ones are in your, in your hand. At your feet they all bow down, and from you receive instruction, the law that Moses gave us, the possession of the assembly of Jacob. And first of all, just this little side note, when you see the word love in the Bible, a lot of people think of that like warm, emotional love. But the love that in the Hebrew is going to be describing something that's uh, loyalty. And if you think about it, that is what love is. You showing loyalty to somebody. Like if you are married to somebody and you're going around and cheating on that person, and you're not showing loyalty, do you really love that person? So love is not just about white, nice, warm emotions. It's about showing, you know, I have this loyalty to this person. So this is saying that God shows loyalty to his people. And it is true. No matter how many times they fail, even though they deserve to be kicked out, he always restores them. But let's talk about the possession of the assembly of Jacob. Uh, I was watching one of Rico's videos, and he was saying that, you know, there's a great distinction that they're making when they say this. How come they didn't say the sons of Israel? If you talk about Jacob, who was the assembly of Jacob? Who was amongst Jacob? It was uh, Rachel, Leah, Zilpha, 
and Bilha. And all those four women, they were pagans. Their father had an idol. So again, you see that he didn't have this perfect Jewish family like they want you to think they have. They had this mixed culture, this mixed multitude. And that's, so basically this is leaving it open for us. So now you can't say, oh, well, the Torah is just for the sons of Israel. It's for the assembly of Jacob, weren't part of that assembly. And we see this theme throughout the Bible of a mixed multitude. When Exodus uh, 12, 37 to 38 happens, uh, after the death of the firstborn and the Israelites leave uh, Egypt, it says the Israelites set out from Ramses to Sukkoth, and the men were about 600,000 on foot, not including the women and the children. And also a mixed multitude went up with them, and sheep and goats and cattle and various uh, livestock. So it wasn't just the Israelites that left. A lot of the Egyptians left too. I mean, why wouldn't they leave? They just saw all their gods get demolished. None of them are real. So might as well join them. So it wasn't just the Israelites. There's a, a whole other group of people that are part of it. And that's where we fit in. And again, if we go to uh, Numbers 33, 10 to 12, we had the bad report from the spies. They, they brought the report about the giants in the land, how it's dangerous, and all the Israelites uh, denied the promised land because they were afraid. And then because of that, God punished them. He said, so God's anger burned on that day, and he swore an oath saying, the men who went out from Egypt from those 20 years and old and above will now see the land that I swore with an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they have not wholly followed me except Caleb, the son of Jephunu, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, because they follow God wholly. So only two guys out of all the other generations were able to see the promised land. And that's not even, uh, so Moses, he was never able to see it, not even Aaron, just those two guys. But what's interesting to point out is uh, Caleb says he's the son of Jephunu, who was a Kenizzite. He's not an Israelite. And if you study what a Kenizzite is, so Caleb is from his father, who's Jephunu, I think I'm saying that right. Who, who was a Kenizzite, and the Kenizzites come from Kenaz. And Kenaz is going to come from Eliphaz, and Eliphaz comes from Esau. And Esau, so technically Caleb would be an Edomite. He's like a family of the Edomites. And if you look at the Bible, the Edomites are bad people. They never do anything good when it comes to Israel. Like, uh, there's a point where they're passing through Edom, and they ask them, hey, hey, can you let us safely pass through? And they told them, no, you can go eat rocks, you know? But Caleb, he's part of their camp. Why is that? And it's because of his heart. His heart wanted to serve Hashem. He wanted to do what was right. He wanted to do what was righteous. And that was what was important. And I think that's a very big uh, thing in like today too, because me being in whatever you want to call it, Hebrew roots or Messianic, uh, whatever label you want to put on that, I've seen a lot of people, they struggle with their identity. Because now they're not part of Christianity. Now they're not part of Judaism. So what am I? And they're so worried what people think about themselves. But it's not about who you are. It's about what you do. That's what's important. And you're going to see that in the New Testament. When he talks to the Gentiles, that's what he tries to explain to them. That it's not about what, uh, who you are. It's about what you do. And that defines who you are as a person. Actions speak louder than words. And then if we go to uh, Yeshua's genealogy, we also see that there's Gentiles in his genealogy. So it starts off saying, this is the ge uh, ge genealogy of Yeshua the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. And remember Tamar, she was a Canaanite. And if you remember the whole situation with Tamar, he thought that she was a temple prostitute. So there's all this uh, dark history in David's lineage. And then from Tamar, you have Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abnidab. Aninab, Aninab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, who was the mother of Rahab. And Rahab was the harlot in Jericho uh, that hid the spies. And if you remember, she hid the spies and she told them that everybody in Jericho was scared because we heard that the sea dried up, which if you guys were studying with us, we understand why that's important. Because back then, if the whatever God had control over the sea had control over chaos, and that God was the supreme God. And that's why she says, we knew that your God is God. So she was able to say, uh, humble herself and say, like, look, this God is the God. If I help you, please help me out. And because of her faith and the actions that she did, she becomes part of Israel. And then from Rahab, you end up getting Boaz, who is the father of Obed. And Obed, his mother was Ruth. And Ruth was a Moabite. And, and Ruth comes after the fact when God says that after the 10th generation 
there would be no Moabite among the camp because of what happened with, um, what was the name? Well, Pinchas, but the, the prophet. Balaam, yeah, what happened with Balaam. So after what happened with Balaam, God said, the Moabites up to the 10th generation, none of them could be part of Israel. But Ruth was an exception. Why? Because of her heart and, and that she wanted to serve and she did righteousness and justice. That, that superseded those laws because God looks past that. If you do have a good heart, he's going to look past those things. Because it's not about who you are. It's about what you do. And then from Ruth, we get Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse become, uh, has, the, has King David. And then from King David, eventually we have Yeshua. So we see from Yeshua's lineage and even King David, there is this whole mixed uh, genealogy with uh, Gentiles. So then, like I said before, in uh, the New Testament, Paul is going to talk to the Gentiles about why it doesn't really matter who you are, but it's what you do. So in Romans 4, it talks about justification by faith. And the question that you have to ask is justification of what? Because when Christians read that, they're reading justification as salvation. But it's talking about justification for you to be part of the kingdom. And we've talked about this before. Like if you guys, if you're not from this country, if you're not from the U.S., and you want to become part of this country, um, you start off as a resident, right? And if you want to apply, you can have a sponsor. And the sponsor is what justifies you to be part of this country. They say, like, hey, Lucas, he's not a crazy guy. I promise you he doesn't do anything crazy. He should be part of this country, you know, me as his sponsor. And that's the, the point of Yeshua. Yeshua is what allows Gentiles to be justified to be part of the kingdom. And so Paul started off in Romans 4, and he says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matters? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. But not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those who, uh, whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. In this blessedness, is this blessedness only for the circumcised? So he's asking, is this blessing only for those who are circumcised? Only those who are Israelites? Are the Gentiles part of that blessing? Or also for the uncircumcised. We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstance was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was before. So he's saying, if you, I think it's Genesis 15, when uh, God acknowledges uh, Abraham because of his faith, because he denied the king of uh, Sodom. Sodom. The king of Sodom wanted to give him a gift. If he took that gift, he would have been the vassal uh, under the king of Sodom. But he denied it because he wanted to follow God. And because of that, God, uh, what, what does the word just say? Uh, it was cre credited to him righteousness. But he wasn't circumcised yet. He still hadn't done that yet. The circumcision came after. So what it's trying to say is that Abraham started his walk by circumcising his heart by faith. So whenever you guys, any of you guys start off his walk and it's by faith, you're starting out just like Abraham. Even though you haven't done that process of circumcision yet, you already are grafted into Abraham's family. Because it, again, it's not about who you are. It's about what you do. And Abraham was the father of all those people that do righteousness and justice. If you do those things and you want to follow God, you're part of the family. Eventually, down the line, you can do circumcision. But it's not, the circumcision doesn't get you into Israel. It's your heart. That's the most important part. Because there's also like a side issue going on in the New Testament where there's some Jews telling Gentiles like, hey, if you want to be an Israelite, you got to circumcise yourself first. And you got to follow the laws right off the bat. But then Paul tells them, like, hey, like, we didn't have to do that. We had this gradual progression. Like, I just showed you from Genesis. It took a while from Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy for them to start following things. And even when they got to Deuteronomy, they didn't do things perfect either. So how can you expect somebody who just started to do something the Israelites never did in the first place? So there's a whole gradual process to everything. First, you got to start your walk by faith, circumcise your heart. And then eventually... You do the thing by flesh. Because the flesh is a symbolism of that faith. You have to have the faith first. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith 
while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised, in order that righteousness might be accredited to them. And he, he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So basically he's saying that he's the father of those who walk by faith, and he's the father of those who are circumcised and follow the law. They're all under Abraham's umbrella. It's just that one has just started his walk, the other one's already there. But they're all under the same house. So you can't deny somebody else because he's not there yet. He's on his way. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise. And again, a lot of people read the promise and they automatically assume it's talking about salvation. But what did God promise Abraham in Genesis 15? The land. So it's talking about the land. The land was not given to him because he followed the law. The land was given to him because he had faith. And the reason why this is so important is back then, if you were a slave and you didn't have any land, you had no freedom. Land meant freedom. So if you're telling a Gentile in that time that you have access to the land and you have ownership of the land, you're telling them that you're not a slave. You're a free man under God. And that's why it's so important, the promise of the land. A lot of people just see the promised land and they see it as something old and antique. But it's crucial for you even today. You have ownership of that land. Once you walk by faith by Abraham, you have ownership of that land. And eventually he even says, I think in Ezekiel 37, 47, 48, one of the chapters, it talks about how eventually they're going to lot out the land and they're going to have foreigners included in that. And they're going to be part of the tribes. So one day in the future, Gentiles are going to have ownership of the land. That is something that the Jewish people cannot deny. It says it there in the, in the prophets. So where was that? His offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath, and, there, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. So what he's saying is that if the promise depended on the law, it would be lost, because how many times did they break it? So it's not based on the law, it's based on faith. And because he made that promise to Abraham, it's always going to be there. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offsprings, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, and whom he believed. The God who gives life to dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Abraham's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That is why it is credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were not written, not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Yeshua, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. And then if you keep reading, you have to read basically the whole book of Romans to keep reading. Because if you just read one chapter with Paul, a lot of it's going to be out of context. But if you go all the way to chapter 7, he's going to explain that he's not talking bad about the law. He's just saying that for you to be an Israelite, keeping the law is not a requirement. It's your walk by faith first. And then you start keeping the law. Just like I said before, if I want to become a U.S. citizen, first I become a resident. Some laws apply to me, and I don't have that many benefits. But then when I become a citizen, now more laws apply to me, and I get more benefits. But there's a whole progression to that. Same thing with you in Israel. If you want to become a full-on Israelite, there's a process. First, you've got to have faith. you got to follow God by faith. And then after a while, when you feel like you're ready enough, you get circumcised, and now you become a full-fledged citizen. And now you get access to all those blessings that the Israel gets. But you also have the consequences of the cursing because it's a responsibility of being an Israelite. And uh, he also goes on to say that the law is not done away with. That's not what he's trying to say. It's, again, all about justification. And uh, the, the purpose that God wants for us to do is to be an example for everybody else. Like I said, it's about our actions. Matthew five thirteen to sixteen, salt and light. Uh, he talk, Yeshua talks about how you are the salt of the earth. But if salt becomes tasteless, by will it uh, by what will it be made salty? 
It is good for nothing any longer except to be thrown outside and trampled underfoot by people. You are the light of the world. A camp loaded on top of, the, of a hill cannot be hidden. I'm sorry. A city located on top of a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they shine a light and place it under a basket. But on a lampstand, it shines on all those in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people, so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So, again, the Torah is not just for you to make sure that you do good things and you stay in your house and that's it. You're supposed to be an example. People, And I'm not saying that you have to go on a street corner and put on a megaphone and start yelling at people how they're going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when you go to work, people are going to tell you, look, you know, there's something different about you. I don't know what it is. You're always doing what's right. You're always helping out others. And then you could say a little thing like, oh, well, you know, that's what the Bible tells me to do. And that's it. But they're going to know that you're different because of that. And if, if you might catch some people, might people get interested, other people are going to deny it. But that's not your problem. Your, pro uh, your main goal is just to be an example. As long as you're an example, you're good. If people deny you, so be it. Yeshua says that they didn't deny you, they deny him because he testifies against the world. And if they accept you, it's even good. You know, I had a friend who I used to work with in my, one of my jobs. Uh, well, you know who he is. But he was not a believer. He was kind of like a basic Christian, whatever. But he noticed, he, he told me after the fact, because eventually he joined Hebrew Roots. But he said, what I noticed was, because uh, we had other friends that were working there that were keeping Hebrew Roots. He said, I noticed that you guys were different. That you guys, you know, there was something different about it. People would always talk about you behind your backs, that you were weird, that you were different. But I saw you, that you were just normal. I saw you, how you behave. I saw your actions. And because of that, he got interested. And then he ended up becoming, you know, he broods and now he teaches the youth over there at the other church. So, you know, he changed a lot. You, you're not going to get everybody, but you might get somebody. And that's the difference. That's the tiny little difference, and it makes a big difference. So you're not going to get everybody, but if you can just change one person, it means a lot. So then Matthew 6, 25 talks about how, what are we supposed to focus on? So for this reason, I say to you, do not be anxious for your life. What will you eat and not for the body? What will you wear? Is your life not more than food and your body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky that do not sow or reap or gather produce into barns. And your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they are? And who among you, by being anxious, can add one hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe the lilies of the field, how they grow. They do not toil or spin. But I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory was dressed like one of these. But if God dresses the grass of the field in this way, although it is here today and tomorrow it is turned into the oven, will he not do so much more for you, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? For the pagans seek after all these things. And, you know, when he said that after studying the ancient Greece, it's true. Their whole main focus is just, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? That's why, that's why they serve the gods. And then you look at us as different. We serve God because we love him and we want to show our loyalty. And he's always righteous to us. There's a whole different dynamic, a whole different relationship that we have with God than they did with their gods. Their gods didn't care about them. Their gods, sometimes they help them out, sometimes they don't because that's how they felt like. But with us, we have that relationship with God directly. And we talked about how the difference between you know the royal uh, treaties one of the unique things that Israel had that the other ones didn't was that they had a direct uh, covenant with God. All the other gods were just witnesses for their covenants. But we actually have a direct covenant with God. None of them could say they had that. And if you look at it, also another thing that was unique is that God promised restoration. We talked about how in the ancient East, if you broke the covenant, it meant total annihilation. They would kill you, your family, anybody uh, affiliated with you, you'd be dead. But God says, look, you're going to get punished. But if you return, I'm going to bring you back. Nobody else had that. And that's why we don't see any uh, more Hittites, any more Babylonians. They're all gone. But Israel's back. They're here in the land because God made a promise that he kept it. And we can see that. So the main thing that you have to focus on from what we teach you guys is uh, not only learn about the Torah, but to also walk it out. Um, because like I said, the Torah teaches you how to have a certain level of holiness. So that way you can get closer to God. Everybody, like if you go to the Christian world, everybody wants to be closer to God and they want to have this relationship and they want to seek him and find him and be near to him. Well, the Torah teaches exactly how to do that. If you want to get near to God, these are the standards that he wants for you. Just like the way Rico puts it. Like if you're, uh, you're in a relationship with somebody else, they're going to have expectations about you. And we understand that with humans, you know. 
if I'm going to be in a relationship with somebody, there are certain expectations that they have for me, and I'm going to do it because I want to be with that person. But when it comes to God, when He gives us our expectations, we don't want to follow Him. But we, we want Him to give us stuff. We want Him to meet up, meet up with us. We don't want to come to Him. And that's the... To come to Him is tough, you know? It's not easy. The Bible talks about the... I think it's in the, the New Testament. Narrow is the way. Winding is the path. It's tough. But if you want to get to that level, well, you're not going to get to this level. But if you want to get close... That's the price. You know? But like I said, uh, this portion is really short, and I'm going to just leave it off here. So we can just close it off. Thank you for watching.